Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Justin the Food Entrepreneur Show. I'm Justin Bizarro. I'm your host. That's B I Z Z A R R O. For anyone who's out there, you can find us on Instagram at Justin the Food Entrepreneurs. If you want to listen to us, you can find us on Spotify or wherever else you grow yourself through podcasts. And if you're hungry and don't want to leave your couch, I recommend the DoorDash app. So, with that being said, I have a very special guest with us. He's I've been following him for a while, for six months, trying to get him on the show. They are blowing up. I will tell you that they've gone up 412,000 follows, at least on Instagram, since I've been following them. Their reels are out of this world. Um, And I want to introduce our guest. He's a very special person out there. I think he's doing wonders in the world of food and creativity. His name is Emil Chiaberry. A burrotino pizza from los angeles california how are you doing today emil i think you corrected me earlier i was off on how many yeah. numbers i said like five hundred and twenty-five thousand. i think you said you're up to five hundred sixty thousand. Yeah, yeah yeah so how are you doing today emil amazing amazing thank you very much i appreciate it i appreciate you so tell me about your story let's start from the beginning did you always love pizza for example like Give us the dirt down and dirty. Take as long as you want. Tell us how you became a, a pizza and food entrepreneur. Yeah, it's kind of an unusual story because neither myself nor my partner, who was who works at a pizza shop, uh, come from cultures where you know they're, they're with strong pizza traditions. Uh, he's uh, he's he's Korean, actually, my partner, and I uh, I come from uh, the Republic of Georgia, which is former Soviet Union. We have similar foods, but not pizza. Uh, but I lived in this country for 30 years. Obviously, I had time to fall in love with it, and uh, but I never learned to. Uh, I'm not a um, I'm not a food maker. I'm not a, I'm not a cook. I don't, I don't work and I don't work at a pizzeria. I don't run. Uh, what happened was we uh, I met this gentleman uh, in the, in, a, in a very interesting way. Actually, we met his wife first. She used to she used to work for us at my other company. And then she told me that uh, her husband works at a pizza shop, and it's amazing. And you know, the owner is selling the place and my mom's job. So we went and we had, and I really did. And at that time, I was selling my other company. We decided to pay this place, and and we bought it. Uh, and from the outset, I, I, uh, I, I have a marketing background. I told him that we we can basically split it into uh, our responsibilities into two. And he will he would run a restaurant, and I would run uh, you know what's uh, I would I would refer to as a digital brand, you know, just just taking care of its uh, social media press and presence and things like that. Uh, and that's how we we've, we've developed. But I you know I I just come from pizzeria. I uh, I'm I'm deeply involved in operations, but not like the cooking process, if you know you know. So uh, and and also I'm I'm very passionate about what we do. I'm passionate about how we do it. And what you know, it's, and it's uh, our social media success is basically us filming who we are, and how we prepare food, and uh, without any you know bells and whistles, just just the, you know making dynamic videos and posting them, and uh, it looked it, it seemed like people really loved it, and that they're loving it. Uh, so that's you know that's that's I guess keys to uh, our key at least to success on social media, just being genuine and loving what we do. I love this. So the idea, like, I mean, you have some crazy things. I think you're known for the pepperoni and ba- black garlic sauce pizza, the home of the 120 pepperoni and black garlic sauce. Um, explain to me all of these things, like your, your marketing, your, your advertising. Like, how did you come up with the ideas for all these pizza? Obviously, you're gaining traction online. And you're gaining traction yeah. through social media. So, part of it is coming up with ideas. Now, is your partner come up with this? How? Do, I mean, how are you guys capturing all this? Like, sort of, how are you pushing it to market? And obviously, you're growing. I believe you have multiple locations. And yes, and we're starting to franchise now, and uh, our locations are um, just not over. You know, overwhelmed on some days. Yeah, but we we got really so those are really high traffic spots, and we're very proud of that. Um, yeah, I mean, what was the uh, first part of the question? I'm sorry. I mean, how did you come up with all the different types of pizzas, even the black garlic sauce? Um, I don't know if you're one of the originals, yeah. but you're the first time I've ever actually seen it um, done on the pizza yeah, that yeah. way. I don't think anyone's made that before. Us. Uh, and I had this idea, like I said, my partner is Korean, and he introduced me to garlic. Uh, and then I thought uh, I tried it with various different foods, and I suggested that we use it. Uh, you know, we create a sauce from that. 
we created black black garlic marinara sauce and and it worked out really well you know just uh, you know the taste you get from it is incredible and you know the aftertaste in my opinion is just as important as, as the taste itself because you know it's kind of a continuation of the taste uh, and the difference is you eat this black garlic and it just leaves for it just lingers you know for for an hour or so uh, in, in a very pleasant way uh, and also another uh, interesting thing about black garlic is that it's incredibly healthy it's it's, it's a real superfood basically it's, it has all the benefits of garlic times two because of the fermentation black garlic is a fer- fermented garlic that's what it is and it has uh, but it doesn't give you any garlic breath so i mean i don't really push health uh, benefits of it because we're a gourmet place we're not a gnc you know or a, a drugstore but it's just nice to know that something so delicious is also good for you this is awesome and i and and where do you i mean you guys are talking about franchising you're talking about building this business you're talking about like how long have you been around? When did you guys open? Like, what were some of the hardest things about opening? Um, and what are some of the lessons you guys have learned along the way? Uh, lessons that we learned along the way is it sounds almost banal. Is uh, is just be yourself because we, the, the most difficult part was to figure out how to attract the customers, as as with any business. Uh, when we purchased it, it already had like base uh, uh you know the basic kind of recipes you know for the dough and all that and my partner just took it to a, like a whole other level he like i said he's a dough whisperer he's, he's like really talented uh and we could we came up with new recipes but the problem was attracting customers because we located our original location is in san pedro and um you know the legend is pizzerias come to san pedro to die basically because there's just so much competition uh it's, wow. it's rich with you know, yes it's a poor town and there's a lot of uh, italian immigrants and croatian immigrants uh I, actually the, the, the previous owner of this place was a croatian uh oh, was wow. croatian and uh, uh and you know it's hard to survive there was another gentleman those are those there, there, there were a few places that run by like famous pizzaiolas and they went out of business it, it was it was really tough and, and a bit scary in the beginning uh but you know, and we tried very, you know, lots of different things. We tried mailing coupon, you know, creating deals and lunch, and, and and nothing seemed to really work. You know, I mean, people were coming, but we couldn't break, uh, you know, uh, into profitability. And we tried like you know the Groupons of the world that all those stuff, you know, all that jazz, and it, it's just there we couldn't see profit. And at the end of the day, we just decided, you know what, we're just going to do what we like to do, which is, you know, feed people. Um, just be, you know, just hug them, I guess, when they come in, <laughs> you know, just, just be ourselves and be generous with, with food. And, uh, and we eliminated all the coupons, deals, uh, and just created one, just like, you know, according to our philosophy of life, just one amazing deal with 365 days a year, you know, the best possible price and the best possible pizza, uh, and just, you know, treat people, just be like an island of humanity in the that's our kind of a you know a motto motto um and uh, again forgive if sometimes i misspeak it's not my na- native language so you know we um uh, and, and and you know and our motto is uh you just do your best and uh you know the person in front of you is always the most important person in the world you know just be an island of humanity in the uh, increasingly mechanized world that's yeah. that's uh, and that's what that's uh, and that's what and and then we just started filming uh, what we do and how we do it and posting on, on uh, posting it on on uh, Instagram. And by the way, there's another thing that kind of the way we started coming out on Instagram. It, it, there were not paid ads, uh, and also we never used like oh the tag a friend or. And I'm not saying if this is right or wrong. It's just uh, all of this. It's just it's just being who you are. You know, uh, acting according to your. Uh, instincts and my instinct was if people want to share my videos if they want to like them they'll do it you know and if they want i won't ask them to um so it was always just putting stuff out there that we think is beautiful you know and uh and uh, you're not, not really trying to sell anything but rather share and it, this this approach worked and it keeps working it's interesting. I agree with this philosophy 100%. I think people, there's a lot of like trying to collaborate and there's a lot of that stuff. 
and it works in some ways, but at the beginning, it, before you have an identity or you actually establish your brand, you it, by attaching yourself to other people or having other people push it, you're almost allowing them to become part of your brand. And so I do agree with this 100%. I think at the beginning, you really need to figure out who you are and what you're going to do as a product or a food or a human or whatever other business you may be in as entrepreneurs. This is a food podcast, so we'll try. I'll talk about that. But in general, I find it even outside of food is that if you don't figure out who you are and you're constantly relying on everyone else to define you, which I would say by getting other people to do stuff and versus just staying true to who you are, I think you'll lose your brand eventually. Even if it grows massively successful, you're going to lose it. You're going to uh, go through an experience of an identity crisis as a business. And you're going to lose customers and possibly your business. Eventually, even through success, it'll bell curve on you pretty bad. So that's one. I want to just comment on that, and I'll let you comment. But on two, I want to just say this. Um, I went to the World Cup in Russia in, in 2018, loved it. And when I was in um, St. Petersburg, we were around. We went to three matches there in St. Petersburg. And there were a lot of Georgians there, actually. And through meeting Georgians, we actually went to Georgian restaurant two nights, two nights in a row, because we had made such friends with them, which I I didn't even know. Like, it's kind of cool because they were almost, I would describe them almost like pierogies or uh, papusas or, but they're, but they were like, almost like pasta on the outside, like a, a, a noodle thing and then they had stuffing stuffed meat and stuffed vegetables and stuff in the inside yeah, it's called hinkale, yeah. Yep. It's called yeah it was yeah, so yeah, yeah. good i mean it was so good and it was and it was before i went into 75 yeah, hard it. Uh, it was yeah, yeah and it was before i went into 75 hard and i was still drinking beer then and I remember how good the Georgian beer was too, because they had Georgian beer on tap. And with the World Cup in town, they were allowing a lot of international stuff into Russia at the time. It was before Russia went into Georgia and did what they did and into Ukraine. So that's a, a totally different story. But um, I feel like the food was just so exceptional, um, especially because Russian food is stereotypically bland. And um, at least for for me, for my palate, based on being in food and the amount, the world and travel and that Georgian food just had such unique flavor and ingredients and combinations. So I just want to touch on that. Like there's a whole world out there of just amazing flavor. And it's just interesting that a Georgian, not from the state of Georgia and uh, someone from Korea created a pizza company that's doing so well. And the reason I like this is because food, even though we think it of as ethnic blocks like okay i'm not italian what do i have any business opening italian restaurant plenty of people do these things open sushi restaurants who aren't japanese it's part of one american culture but it's also now part of the world culture we see in the world that people are hybriding products and we're just talking about you have the black garlic sauce which is came from a korean inspiration which is now part of pizza which is everyone thinks of italian because it was once an italian peasant food even though the way we eat in the united states is nowhere near what it used to look like in italy or croatia or whatever because italy didn't actually come around until 1898 and pizza started and pizza sauce started way back in the 1400s and 1500s when tomatoes first came to europe in after Columbus sailed the ocean blue, just so everyone knows. Like, there was no tomato sauce in Asia, in Europe before then, okay? There was no tomatoes, okay? They came from the Americas. So, again, Native American stuff, imported uh, vegetable, imported into Europe, into Africa, into Asia, you know, then becomes yeah. pizza sauce, which becomes pizza. So a Native American product then becomes an Italian pizza, which then you guys get the rest of it. It does. It's not a staple. We create things throughout centuries that become new things or combined cultures or hybrids or however you want to look at it. Fusion, I think, was a weird term we used a lot in, in culinary world. And I was a part of that in the 2000s. And I actually hate the term. I get the idea. But I think it's way more than that. So, um, And it takes away from the actual creativity of the chef saying they just fuse two things together. No, it's a lot more than that. So um, let me go back to the other question, which is, like, when you guys came together and as you're building this business, like, how do you guys, like, 
as business partners, you talked about, okay, you're a great chef and, and I'm going to take the digital side. But I mean, talk to me about like day to day stuff. Like what does your guys day look like? How do you interact? Because your partnership is also a reflection of how well your company does. Okay. And how well it does on social media is how well two partners coordinate. I, I can't tell you everyone's like, oh, it's a special thing. There's an energy that happens when people do business well, when people get along well, that displays in the things that are like your Instagram. It's not only the reels. What's coming out in the reels is your passion and your love for the food. So talk to me about how you guys interact with one each other. You know, what's your best qualities and leadership qualities for yourself and for your partner, for example? Sorry, that was a lot. Oh, no, 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 no worries. Uh, <laughs> Even though we come from you know, different parts of the you know, the, uh, world, what we share is uh, the tradition of hospitality. Uh, in Georgia, as you mentioned, you know you, you just touched on our food and uh, how diverse it is. Uh, it's because Georgia is located smack in the middle of a Silk Road. So uh, over over the course of centuries, there were different you know lots of different people from all over the world with their cultures, food, uh, languages were passing through it. Uh, and we developed a strong culture of hospitality because that's what you need if you you know if you want to uh, you know if you want to be a trading nation uh, in that in that kind of a location. Um, and uh, Lee also, you know, in their culture, you know, guest comes from God, and you know, and and you just need to put food on the table and you know enjoy it and and have and, and treat them the best way you can. So we have that in common, uh, and that always comes first. Uh, we, you know, now as far as like how our day goes, you know, he gets up early in the morning. It goes shopping. Uh, in addition to what the distributors deliver, he, go, he goes to uh, the market and he goes to you know restaurant depot just to get fresh stuff. Uh, then you know he, he arrives at the store and the, the workers are already there and then doing prep work. I come maybe a little bit you know prior, before opening and we'll make some videos while. There are no people, and you know nobody's. Um, we're not getting. In, I'm not getting in the way, because you know space is a bit tiny. The kitchen. Uh, I mean, it's not tiny, but there's lots of people because we're you know very busy, and I just don't want to be a nuisance uh, with my with you know with my phone. Um, so I'll just do some videos. Then I'll come back, uh, you know, throughout the day, a couple of times, uh, and just talk to people, talk to the employees, and um, uh, just talk to my partner if he needs anything. Now we have an incredible chemistry as far as like on a personal level you know he's i love this guy because you know uh, he's just one of those rare people who are incapable of lying like at a, on a physical level you know i think it's just like not acceptable and uh incredibly honest straightforward sometimes a little too straightforward i had to teach him how that customers are, are, are really are not are just personal and you know it's our goal it's it's our um uh Possibility to basically uh, be to everyone. I mean, I, I, I had to teach him that because he was treating people as, as if they're coming to, to form a personal relationship with him in the beginning. So, but but once once he understood that, it, it, it was a you know it was a very quick process. We both enjoy just just treating people. We both it's unacceptable. We would get really mad. And mistakes do happen, of course. And you know, and, uh, some customer may, but when the customers sure wings that were burned, I mean, I I just because in my opinion, you know, just to give this, and I and I go and I talk to people. I don't you know, yell or uh, get mad. I talk to my, tell me, would you would you feed this to your mother? And would you give this to your? What makes you think that you can give this to a person? You know, like if you didn't touch it. That means you don't you don't respect them, you know, and, uh, and that's just not acceptable. And and just go uh, this because this I, I believe is the the most important part um, as far as you know the, the restaurant vibe and you know how the operations run. Okay. So I always talk to to talk to employees about you know how they understand their place in the world and. Uh, you can you can be anywhere, but you need to understand why you're there and what you're doing, uh, and it's for your own benefit as, for, as well as everybody else's. And what I'm trying to convey to them is that, uh, look, just try to imagine, you know, just try to imagine a guy who drives home from work. You know, he probably had a, you know, a tough day at work, and then maybe some, you know, we live in LA, maybe, uh, you know, he, he got into some kind of a 
I don't know, the traffic or somebody gave him a finger on the way home and, you know, he's already not in the mood and he's heading home for more problems, probably. You know, and throughout the whole experience, nobody even knows his name. Nobody cares. And that's how a lot of people feel. And then they call, you know, the, they deal with, uh, they call the company, it's an automated message and, uh, you know, they, they, they don't get the response. And when they get the response, nobody wants to customize things for them. Nobody wants to, you know, just uh, uh, make an extra step, accommodate them. That's how a lot of people feel now. Uh, and this is your opportunity to brighten up his day. You know, just this is your opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to do something good. And, and, and that's not difficult at all. All you have to do is just look him in the eyes and remember his name and care what you give him. You know, and that's going to enrich your life and his life. And, you know, that also makes food taste different, I believe. Um, I agree. I, I have this weird belief. I, I have this, you know, weird belief. And I, you know, uh, like my wife calls it a superstition. I, I just believe that bad people can cook good, can make good food. I just never met one. You know, I agree like, with you, actually. People who are, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, just, just remembering it. Uh, you know, my mother had a cousin who was not, you know, like I said, I don't want to say anything negative, but was not a very liked, you know, well-liked person. And there were reasons for that. Uh, but my mom still loved her. Loved her. My mom could, could just make food out of, like, scraps and people line up to eat it. And she, she, the cousin was, you know, was doing a lot better financially. And she, she would with these recipes, she tried to learn, and she would buy like the most expensive food, and nobody just, just didn't taste good. Uh, and I and it kind of stuck with me, and I, I and I throughout my life, I I always paid attention to this, and I I still hold this belief. You know, so, uh, you know, I, that's you know, that's basically yeah. What what? It's not complicated. You know, we we love what we do. Uh, we love people, you know, and you know, we try to, you know. We just got this piece of our heart, you know, and, uh, in addition to uh, to pizza. And I guess it's a good combo. <laughs> well, and here's a few things. I agree with you. Those who are sort of have a spiritual malady or have something negative going on inside of them or they're not a good person because of it at this point, it's coming out, the symptom's not good, you can't put love into food. If you don't have it inside you, you can't put love into food. And food is part of that. It's nourishment for the humans. I believe the same thing. I I can always tell like if this has a good partnership, if it's a good restaurant, is the company succeeding? Does they have a good culture? It's based on the quality of the food. And does it taste good? And even, you know, where we start mass producing food, is that person care about the food or do they care about the profit? Because it comes out in their food. You know, the massive companies, how much do they care about your food? Watch in the taste of their food. Go to a restaurant or go to a location where they actually pour love into it, enjoy what they're doing and treat you like a human. I agree with you. And here's what I like about this, okay? Because we have no control over anything in this world, okay? We have no control over what's happening in that customer's life before he gets there, okay? We have no control what their temperament is. And a lot of the time when something goes wrong or something's perceived wrong by the customer, it's not always wrong, but it may be perceived wrong, they're, if they've had a bad day, it comes out in a, a very loud way, in a very strong way, in a very aggressive way. However, if you can cut through that and understand that it's them, not you, but there is a message in here to be fixed, and I agree with you, this is an opportunity to suddenly make their day better. How can I fix this? And I can tell you, being in the food business and traveling around, and I'm in food establishments, I'm with food entrepreneurs all the time. And I have, like, I still have a personal life. I still have things. There are days where I'm like, I feel like a train ran over my body, okay? Like, I'm down, doing 75 hard, and I'm doing all this, and then there's, like, some emotional damage that comes in. You know, I have a horse, and he's 39 years old, which is 117 years in, in, in human years. And I'm just like, holy crap. And, you know, trying to fix that. And one day, some days are better. Some days I'm celebrating. But when I go into these food places, or even when I do these, uh, these interviews, there's a way that entrepreneurs in food who are successful – display love and give it to the world it's it's not it's through the food number one but number two it becomes part of who they are if they weren't that way already of a giving of a building a relationship and i love the thing that you said about your partners because i understand that i understand that 
like to me as Justin, like I see, I don't see things as transactional. I see things as relational. And, you know, for someone to come up to me, I'm always like, even if it's a new customer, I still to this day as an Italian, knowing I need to break bread first before we ever talk about money or we ever talk about a deal or even when we start talking about business, like, and and it's maybe Japanese in a way or Korean in a way or whatever, or, or even Italian or Greek. Like if we can't break bread and we can't eat and we can't share the love of food together and we're going to be doing the food business together, it's very hard for me to go beyond that as a relationship in entrepreneurs because I don't, if you don't have the time to sit down and enjoy it and build a relationship, especially over food, because that's the business you want to be in with me, then it's, it, it normally is a no brainer. People are like, Oh, you didn't even review it. You didn't even do your due diligence. No, I did. I sat down at the table. I broke bread. I saw what kind of character they have by doing that. That is, that's way more important to me than how much money it's potentially going to make or how much money they've made in the past or what kind of partner or how we fit together. If there's no character there and love for food and enjoyment of food, or, and if they're a chef, if they're not producing good food consistently, there's something else going on there. And you don't want that into your business. And that's just an example for me as an entrepreneur and the way I do deals. And um, working on a deal right now with, you know, we're rebuilding a food service company and we're calling it Freedom Foods and we're working on consolidating healthy uh, concepts into fast food chains and fast casual chains um, with central production. But one of the things I will tell you is there are tons of people that I met that I've considered bringing into this partnership that when you break bread, that it comes down to the money. They can't stop talking about the money. And I'm like, if you're going to focus on the money, you're going to drive straight into the guardrail. It's like focusing on the thing you don't want to focus on because if you focus on it too much, you lose fact what actually brings the money. You want money to attract to you, you know, and come naturally. Don't worry about it. Do the right thing by the humans. Treat them like people. Put love into your food and build relationships. Um, I do agree, though, in in the case of when you're doing a business or a restaurant or a, a food truck that – you you can't spend so much time at the beginning building relationships. You got to give them the food, and you got to make sure they're enjoying it, and then slowly starting to build a relationship and trust. Uh, no different than I said, horses. Like I'm not just going to jump on a horse and hope I can ride it. I have to build a relationship. They call breaking, but. They, you slowly build a relationship with the horse. You build trust. They gain new skills. You, even if you already know what you're doing, you're gaining new skills because you're building a relationship with the horse. And I think that that's what I try to coach and everyone is it's like, okay, like you're, it, you have to build trust and trust takes time, whether you're dating someone, whether you're building a business or whether you're establishing a relationship with your customers, your clients or your vendors, uh, and even your employees or team members. So I love that we're talking about this because I think it's very important. I think, again, I want to anchor it. The success that you're having, the the mindset that you're having, the ability to go into pizza, you know, the pizza triangle, as I, I called it and heard it, which where like it's the it's like the it used to be in the Bahamas, the Bahama Triangle or whatever. I can't remember. Or the, what was it used to? And ship planes and stuff used to disappear there. We don't talk about it. Bermuda Triangle. I said Bahamas the Bermuda Triangle, but it is like that. I And I have heard that in San Pedro where it is like the Bermuda Triangle of pizza and a lot of other food places. Anything Italian, um, uh, European in nature, like has a lot of trouble, especially in communities like San Pedro. There's communities like in Chicago and even New York where there's so much authenticity and so many immigrants and they're used to the way that the things are. It's very hard to compete unless you come up with a new way, you you start steering away from the tradition somewhat, and you become creative and you become yourselves, like uh, Baratino did in this case um, with what you guys are doing. So, explain to me the hundred and twenty pepperoni thing. Like, it's obviously a staple. Why that number? It's a good marketing thing, but what is it that you're trying to combat there? And what are you trying to say about your pizza versus everyone else's? Uh, when I came in, and uh, this was one of the, uh, I, I, as a marketer, I I looked at the menu and uh, started thinking of creative ways to, uh, you know, effective ways of marketing. And I looked at the pepperoni pizza, how covered it was. I was like, how many pieces do you put on it? He says, well, you know, it's at least one, 120. Uh, and it always depends on the diameter of a pepperoni because it, it just comes in in different diameters, even from the same supplier and the data from the same supplier. But even with, you know, within the same pack, you can have um, pepperonis of a different diameter. 
and within the same batch. Uh, so depending on the diameter, it's anywhere from anywhere from 120, which is you know minimum, it, almost never 120, it's like 125, whatever 130, all the way to 150. Uh, and I was like, wow, 120 pepperoni, and it's just like you know kind of rolled up the tongue, and uh, it's uh, you know it's just something that's easy to remember, and with a uh, you know let's, let's let's be honest, pepperoni pizza is a commodity. You know, everybody tells it. It's a it's a number one popular pizza in America, and yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, yeah, so so uh, that was a way to stand out, uh, and it, it also I believe that the combination of our crust and uh, you know the, the number of pepperonis really does make this pizza stand out. Um, we um, and you know that's how that's how we started marketing it, and it just caught on because it's easy to remember. Uh, it's marketing 101. Um, and here's an interesting fact: If uh, on on TikTok, uh, the combined views for just you know pepperoni, just generic pepperoni, is, I think stands as right now somewhere around 790 million views, uh, and 200 million views are 120 pepperoni from that. So it's like almost um, you know a quarter. That's that's but, incredible. I, yeah, I, so I haven't figured out world, TikTok you know? yet, but I'm like, I'm still dealing with Instagram and I've started TikTok, but like, yeah. I love this because one of the things is I will tell you I had, I had pizza the other night. Um, it wasn't from someone on this show, so it's not anything like that. I was just running late and I was tired and um, it was right before, it was about three weeks ago, right before I started 75 hard again, my last cycle on 75 hard uh, for the year. And, um, and so I ate, I got, I was like all excited. I want pepperoni. They're telling me it's like extra pepperoni pizza was what it was called. I am not kidding you. They were like, they were the size of quarters, the pizza. And there was like three little ones per slice. And I'm telling you, it was a 20 inch pizza. It was huge. Um, and I had like hardly any pepperoni. I was called the extra pepperoni. So like when I did it, it was when I started thinking about reaching out to you guys again to get, try to get you back on the podcast. I'm like, you know what? There's a lot to this. You know how much more I would pay if it had pepperoni all over it? I'd be willing to pay more. I'd be willing to pay more if it were covered in meat of any kind. But the fact that like you're calling it extra pepperoni and it hardly has any pepperoni on it, I feel like conned. I feel gypped. I feel like, whoa, what's going on here? You should call it not not so much pepperoni. And um and that's not against them. It's just I think you know we we see things in life and we're like, oh, there's financial pressure and all that. And instead of trying to increase the value to charge more and come up with a way to market it, we often skim down the cost. Oh, we'll just keep removing pepperoni off the pizza until someone's finally removed almost all the pepperoni on the extra pepperoni pizza. And so now it's not now it's not uh, now it's not a menu item. It's a contradiction and. That's the thing that we run into a lot in marketing is your mar- people are marketing, 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 extra pepperoni, but then you deliver a product as a contradiction. And no matter how good you treat the customer, I'm still like, but there's not enough pepperoni on here. You don't care enough to actually deliver what you're even marketing. Like you're not following through what you say you are. And in this case, for me, it's not doing what you say you're going to do. And I think yeah, that as yeah. that's hurt a lot, a lot of pizza businesses out there especially the chains is they keep skimming costs they have some guy in a white tower for lack of a better term in middle of nowhere that's never been in the pizza shop that doesn't understand the way pizza has changed and they keep lowering the value they keep getting the crust and the dough cheaper and the cheese is not even real cheese anymore and they mass uh, produce this we don't do any of that. yeah no, and, we're on the opposite side of that spectrum yeah, exactly a, in fact sometimes we learn sometimes we learn uh if anything I mean, now that we're starting to franchise, we have to be a little more, a little bit more methodical about this. But you know, a couple of times we found out, like later, that we're just selling some things at a loss. Uh, and like for example, wild boar. We were selling wild boar uh, uh, sausage and pepperoni for a while, and it's an expensive product. Uh, you know, and uh, it was just slightly more expensive than we were, were, were initially miscalculated. And then, like a year later. We, you know, we learned that we barely, if any, if any, it's like breaking even. If, uh, uh, but you know, our business thrives; it flourishes regardless because 
uh, you know, like I said, you know, you don't have to obsess over every penny when you do everything right. And when you do right by people, they'll come back and they'll, um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll carry your business. You know, it's not, you're, you're not going to go out of business if you're, if you do, if you make good food and if you're good to your customers uh, and you know how to promote it. Uh, I, I don't believe that you, I mean, that's my, that's coming from my experience. Uh, and of course, everybody's got their own system and everybody's got their own method. But, you know, we're, we just kind of try to focus on the, on the customer experience first and our interactions. Uh, and, oh, you know, we're not completely stupid. We're not going to buy something for like a dollar and say five cents for 50 cents. Uh, but, you know, those kinds of things slip in only because we, you know, we care more about the experience. That's, that's the flip side of it. You know, and uh, even though we don't do uh, coupons, what we do periodically is we throw like a free free pizza party, for example. Like uh, recently, and, and sometimes they're spontaneous. Uh, we need to do, um, you know, to, to for franchising, we need to do new menus where, and we take pictures of all the pizzas. So I was like, oh man, I'm going to make like, I don't know, 20 pizzas today, all for pictures. Uh, and what I did is I was like, I posted on Instagram uh for you know that we're going to be doing this and there will be free pizzas and if anybody from you know before we open anybody wants to come in we can just you know uh you're going you're to eat our basically you know menu models if you like and a lot of people showed up and it was an incredible vibe and we had to cook hell of a lot you know like extra pizzas but it didn't matter it was just such a good vibe um yeah, and so, and and then you know we we do we do events like this from time to time, and people just come in, and everything is free, uh, and we don't ask for people to. There's no catch, you know. Nobody needs to like give us their email address or whatever, buy anything. Uh, you know, we just announce it and say, you know what, if, if you want to eat or you want to meet us, just come in, you know, and uh, let's hang out, and people love it. So that's 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 that, that's our way of uh, you know putting ourselves out there. It seems to be working. Uh, and we enjoy it, which is, uh, you know, which is important. I love this a lot, actually. And I think that one of the things that you're doing, and here's, I'm a big fan of this, just so everyone knows, I'm not a fan of discounting. I'm not a fan of coupons. I think because what happens is people will eventually, the, the real loyal shoppers shop for the coupons and wait for the deals. And then you're, you're getting a customer that's loyal and great, but they're constantly underpaying for what, you need them to pay and you've created this weird trend unless you then mark up your prices and your coupon price is your real price and then you make money on the other thing which department stores do. Um, I don't think it's like the right way to do it. I think what you're doing is 100% right. It's This is my value. Oh, thank you. And, well, it works for us. And um, and yeah. if it's going to be something that I'm going to give away, I'm not going to give away money on every pizza. I'm going to let you sample my product. I'm going to show you what I'm doing, and I'm going to bring you guys in to be involved and give away the stuff instead of throwing it away. And I think that that's the best yeah. way on the planet. It's also why you're having the success and why your pizzas looked at, at such a premium, in my opinion, and why it's driving value. And there's a yeah. lot of pizza companies on here, I agree. And, you know, there's there's a lot of them that are doing well in their own niches. But to hit the premium takes a different type of thing. It takes a different type of mindset. One, it takes you guys are really going outside of the box. You know, I've you know, some of it's like I've, the sourdough pizza we've talked about. When you start to go out of that and start to create this premium uh, pizza, you guys aren't doing sourdough. I'm referring to another podcast. But you start to do this thing that's a premium and you add value, and then people are rewarded for the value, meaning, you, hey, man, we have these extra pizzas, come by, and everyone gets excited, but it's not like, okay, I'm waiting for the next coupon, and then there's no excitement, it's just an expectation, because what happens with coupons, like what Little Caesars does, Papa John's, Domino's, uh, Pizza Hut, as the main four that I would say, conglomerates, is... Um, are, are big pizza companies they um conglomerates would be a group of companies that's not what they are that's the wrong term sorry but the these massive corporations they the coupons everyone expects those values and everyone shops for the coupon or looks for the deal and you're almost not even driving your best pizzas to the consumer's mouth or your best flavor you're just the consumers are looking for a deal and the value that they can get and so Again, maybe they're not looking for high quality pizza, but I will say the difference now in today's world with how these corporations have skimmed corners and and try to reduce their costs and, and use artificial ingredients and, you know, not even cheese sometimes. It's one of those things where 
that's what I like what you guys are doing because I feel like pizza needs a new face on a franchisable scale that you're talking about and what you're doing. And I love that you guys are doing it. So I want to talk about how you guys are going to franchise. How do you guys decide what to do with that and, and how you're doing it? But first, I want to talk about what are the most popular items on your menu? What seem to be your favorites? And do you guys do any specialties like for the holidays or anything like that? Uh, we only do uh, Thanksgiving pizza uh, once a year. And people are actually, a lot of my friends are asking me to like, keep it throughout the year. But uh, you know, then it's not going to be a Thanksgiving pizza anymore, will it? So, and, you know, so, so that's, uh, that's seasonal. Um, beyond that, we don't do anything. We don't do other car shaped pizzas because we're so busy, honestly, that it creates a bottleneck. You know, we, we can't really keep up with, uh, you know, with stuff like that. Um, uh, we, I like everything. You know, we don't really keep uh, stuff on the menu that we don't like. Uh, we try to keep it tight. And, uh, you know, my, my personal favorite, I would say, would be um, probably a white, white clam pizza, you know, because I'm a weird guy and I like garlic. So it's, uh, it's a real white clam pizza with bacon. Uh, and it's, it's made with our special white garlic sauce. And you know, it's, it's really, you know, it's, I don't know, it just works for me. Uh, so yeah, but we like everything. I I I pay, we pay very close attention. We uh we, we change items very. We add new pizzas um very rarely. You know, it just has to be something outstanding for us to expand our menu. That's it. You know, it's um just keep it tight, uh, but but have enough interesting ingredients so people can uh, improvise. And improvise yourself. You know that gives us the ability. Keeping interesting ingredients uh, in the mix gives you the ability to create good content, also, and to attract people who are into that kind of experience. But most people, honestly, uh, they will see like a wild boar pizza, and they will see like an interesting combination. It will attract your attention, but they'll come in and, and they'll order a pepperoni pizza. That's what happens in ninety percent of the time. Um, so a lot of stuff just uh, is interesting at the level of content, but people never actually. Uh, convert into um, you know the, 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 to, to into eaters of that of that stuff. When and and on so, that. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, what else I was gonna say? Uh, yeah, wild boar. Wild boar is amazing. I love that, especially with black garlic. I like wild boar in general. I love this, and that's a really it's cool a very concept. Italian thing, by the way. Yes, uh, wild boar. Yeah, Cingale. In, in Italy, uh, the, the, there's a lot of stuff being done with wild boar. So whenever Italians come in, they're just they're, they're super happy. <laughs> that is true, yeah. and I think it's actually a name of um, a deli company, uh, Italian deli meats, called as a boar company or something like. Or was I guess maybe it's owned by someone now. But same idea, I believe. I'm not positive on that. I'd have to look again. But um, it's been quite some time since I looked into that. But I agree with what you're saying 100%. So I'm going to have two questions here. Um, the first one is, once you started seeing your social media take off, the reels that you were doing, did you see an immediate impact to your restaurant? Did people start coming in? Because social media can far, like your likes and stuff like that can go well outside your geography. Tell me about that. It was only one location. Did you see an immediate like response, how long before like the store and the revenue caught up with the reels counts going up and well, your and your social media going up? Uh, we started want to start posting. Uh, since resolve go while to really ramp it up and to uh, you know to expand our reach, uh, and we've become a destination place after that. And of course, you know we're uh, we're not like a there's a reason why we were approached by all these uh, French companies. We each, we're really like a global brand now. So uh, the local brand outgrew our uh, you know ground presence, and so the ground needs to catch up now, uh, and that's what we're doing. Uh, and uh, but the, you know, it, it's also if the social media is an interesting thing. Like I don't like social media personally. Uh, like I don't have a social media account, a personal social media account. Uh, and 
because it, and now I can't because I spent so much on, you know, on the Burkina account. I, I respond to we respond to almost every comment. I mean, I, every comment. I, the, the comments that I respond to are the ones that I'm not worth responding to, and there are some of those, you know, obviously. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, it's it's just that you know it, I know it's hard to tell who's genuine and who's not on social media, but somehow people are able to. And you build those genuine relationships with people online, and even those who live far away, they just write me, and, and, and I get a tremendous, honestly, uh, for me, for social media is an extremely positive experience. Uh, that's why I don't want to have a personal one because uh, you know it will probably be different. But with this one, all I get all day is how much people love me, how much people love pizza, uh, how it just made their day, and this this is different than marketing any other product. I mean, good luck getting that with like health insurance. You know, it's uh, you can't. Uh, so there is a nature of business, of course, that that plays a role. Uh, pizza is very, uh, you know, it's very well suited for for uh, you know for social media marketing, I believe, because pe- everybody loves it uh, and uh, people like to share it. If they see something they like, they want to send it to another person that they care about, uh, and it's ninety nine percent positive. You know, so. Uh, but it but it does take a while to uh, you know to, to build up. Um, I respond to every comment because, first of all, I appreciate that people watch it and they come back, and I deeply appreciate it. You know, uh, because they don't have to. You know, they they can go and you know they can watch anything they want. Uh, and also, it builds it builds. Uh, and I, I guess it's a bit of an advice uh, to someone who listens. Uh, it builds a community that pushes every post almost like you have this base support group. And when you post something, they're the first ones to come in and just to, uh, you know, to comment and send it to their friends. And it gives uh, your marketing uh, a very valuable, uh, uh, you know, push. I mean, a very, very sizable push. So you need to care about that. Um, but it's it is social media is is uh, you know is a way of connecting with the world, of course. Uh, that is you know incredible. Just incredible. I mean, I I spent my entire life in marketing. I I, I used to do like commercials on television, infomercials on on, uh, on television, radio, uh, and I would never dream of something like that. That you can create something and people will be sending it to each other, you know, and sharing it amongst each other. I know where they're doing so, the marketing for you. It's kind of the craziest thing on the planet, yeah, right? But, you know, but, but they need to. You just need to. You just need to give them something that they would really like. You know, and how do you do that? Uh, I guess you post what you like, you know, because you can't constantly, I, I, I just, I just don't operate like that. You know, I, I can't maybe, you know, a lot of people can, and they're very successful at it, but we can't, uh, I personally can't market something I don't like, you know, it's just, it doesn't work for me. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Um, so at and and talk to me about this. How did you guys decide, like, what was the decision point? Cause now you have two locations how did you decide, like, a lot of entrepreneurs can't get past the first one. They're too scared. They don't want to leap. Like, how did you guys have the conversation? What made you guys decide to open another one? How did you choose the location? Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, it, it, we wanted to expand because we were overwhelmed. We could not. Uh, we wanted to, uh, first of all, the second location was a necessity. It was not even our, uh, you know, desire to grow. Because during COVID especially, we were just, you know, the wait times sometimes were like two or three hours. And that's on weekdays. You know, and, uh, and it was Jesus. just no way. Uh, oh my God. I know. Yeah, and uh, we, we had to buy a you know, second oven. And even with the second oven, you know, there's only so many times you can uh, open and close an oven you know, throughout the day because people is, pizza is going to get bubbly, you know, it gets cold. Uh, 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 so we were just like, you know what, it's, it's starting to affect um, – it's starting to affect quality of the pizza, you know, and we can't have that. Uh, and so we, uh, and also so many people needed to work just to carry this volume uh, that it was just like not enough space. So that's how we decided to open something that would be, you know, not too far, but far enough to not you know, completely cannibalize our spot. So we, we found a place, it was a lucky break, that was uh, almost completely built out uh, in Carson, which is about 15 minutes uh, drive from us. And we opened the place there. Uh, then a friend of mine, a close friend of mine in Canada, 
uh, who lives in Canada. He was just dying to open a place. And uh, we weren't franchising, of course, but he's my friend of 30 years. And uh, I just really love the guy. And I know that he's a serious businessman. And I, I just did a, like a one-off licensing deal with him. And that place is doing really well in Canada, too. It's, uh, in Toronto, it became it's one of the hottest you know, pizzerias there. So, and, and by the way, here's the magic of social media. When we opened that uh, Canadian place, he was busy from day one. There were lines from day one, and it's all based on our marketing. And just uh, so everyone knows, like they, it's Buratano Pizza Toronto. Uh, we're talking to Buratano Pizza now, and they already have twenty four thousand plus followers on their account for the uh, the one that's in Canada and Toronto. And I love that. I had done some research. I was wondering, like, is that a franchise? Because you weren't franchising yet. I didn't actually know you were franchising until we got on this call, on, well, the pre-call. And, like, so I love this. I mean, you just went international just because, I mean, 500,000-plus followers is an international presence. And you, it basically tapped into it. And you're and right. We have, 600, we have over 600 on uh, TikTok also. Jesus. Uh, 665, uh, six, I believe. So yeah, it is. It is a uh, uh, you know, it is outsized. Uh, it's it's um, you know, it's way bigger than our restaurant. So you know, we're we're happy about that. I love it. Um, so w- if you could tell anyone anything, any food entrepreneurs out there, like leadership skills, like what have you guys learned the most in this business? Like what lessons do you think are the most important for anyone trying to be a food entrepreneur? Oh, there's so many. Uh, I don't know if I can really, uh, like I said, it's almost banal. Just be yourself, you know, like understand why you went into this business and what you're doing. Um, you, uh, I, I just never, and, and, and again, this is not a knock on other people or uh, this is not to say that this is the only way uh, to do things. Sometimes you just, you know, and this is a valid way of choosing a business uh, is to look at what's doing well and, uh, you know, uh, choosing that line of business and falling in love with it. Um, or not falling in love with it, but just doing a good job. So that's the way of you know to do it. But for us, we both uh, both of us, you know, the partners in this business are very similar people in that sense. That um, we like to understand who we are, you know, like to, to know who we are and uh, what we're doing, uh, and who we're doing it for. And that's the most important thing for us. And I know that I'm a guy who likes other people. I love food. I love, sh- I love sharing it. And my, uh, my place in the world is to make uh, people uh, happy on a daily basis just with little things, you know, nothing major. Uh, but just stop by and I'll give you a good food. I'll smile. I'll shake your hand. I'll give you a hug. You know, I'll send you on, uh, you know, on your way. But I believe it's like a little thing that's important and everybody needs it. Uh, you know, just like sometimes one glance can send somebody or one gesture can make somebody mad or make somebody, uh, you know, put somebody in a good mood. And you have that power. To me, the biggest power we have, and my, this is my personal deeply held belief, the biggest power a human being has is to bring out the best and the worst in other people. And we can do it very easily. You know, uh, and and then it creates a chain reaction. I mean, then obviously, I don't want to be too banal with this, but this is uh, it's obvious, you know. And uh, but yeah. but that's what it that that's what I believe, and that's what we both believe, and we we act on it. I agree in that train reaction and that ripple effect. And I actually think the better you get as an entrepreneur, uh, the more you surround yourself with people, the more you deal with customers, clients, team members, employees, vendors, however you want to look at it. Uh, social media, you actually become more in tune with individuals. And as entrepreneurs, like at first, I didn't realize that this was going on, but you can actually, you have a power that you develop and, and it's a power because it comes with great responsibility. And I agree with this and I've misused it by accident or, or misunderstood it and misused it. But we have a very strong power to help people we can make people's lives worse. We can make people's lives better. We can change their temperament. We can actually, and we feel weirdly what they're going through for some reason. We can feel it. We can understand it. We can change their momentum. And yeah, yeah, just because, yeah. And it's, I'm sorry. I didn't, yeah, no, no. Go ahead. Continue. Uh, no, it's. Just, it, it, well, I was just going to basically say that you're exactly right. Yeah, you, you get you become more attuned. Um, and of course, you know this is not all of it. Uh, number one thing in business, you have to be competent. Yeah, because you, if you're not competent, you can't make people happy. You know, the stuff that you're going to be doing is not going to be coming out right. Uh, so, number one thing, you have to get really good at what you do. 
uh, and don't cut any corners. Uh, I believe generosity is is a is a, is a very underrated uh, tool in business. Uh, like I know tons of people, and some of them are, are my good friends uh, who own restaurants in the area. Uh, you know, because I've become that like a you know restaurateur, <laughs> so I know people, and they just like get too bogged down in little you know dollars and cents. And again, I understand it, uh, but uh, you know this is not something I would do, and it, it would never work for me. So you just need to figure out what works for you. But number one thing is com- competence and caring. You know, caring and, and, and remembering why you're doing this. You're doing this to what? What is the economy? Well, what is the economy? Economy is like us solving each other's problems, basically. You know, and 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 uh, and you know, this is your job. Your job is to feed people. And remember, there is a huge difference between food and a feed. You know, feed is something animals get, uh, or something you get it like in mass production. You know, we'll just don't care about the quality. Uh, you know, you don't want to make, you know, see how the sausage is made, you know, from these huge companies and just throw it out there and cheap. You know, that's not what you do. You want to you, you want to make the kind of sausage that people want to see how it's made, you know, uh, because it will. Uh, and that's actually what we do. We, we a lot of times we, we show how we make food because there's, there's no corners there that we cut. You know, everything's high quality. So you're not ashamed to share it. I love uh, this. Quality, caring, competence, and caring. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's it's one hundred percent on, and you guys show that. So, let's talk about how when you when you're growing, and now that you're franchising, and you helped open a location in Toronto, like your business partner is part of the operations, and like obviously he was involved in the kitchen. Like, how have you guys started to separate yourself out? And and I guess for lack of a better term. You've, you're no longer working as much in your business as you're working on your business. So how did you guys make that transition? How are you making sure that all the locations run similarly and have the right training and, and keep the product consistently? Uh, well, keeping product consistently, uh, it's, it's, it's training, of course, uh, and uh, just being very careful of with who you hire. Mm, it's it's tricky. I won't lie to you. You know, and the biggest danger, actually, and I was surprised to learn that when I just started uh, this business and I was just doing my research, the trickiest part is um, is expanding from two uh, two locations to three because you can manage two locations. It's it's uh, it's very hard to manage. Uh, you know, uh, still in that same mode that you managed your first location. Third location, you can't. Just, just not enough time. So, and then the different skills come. Skill comes into play. Uh, the skill of delegating and 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 and, and uh, uh, just really keeping your tabs on on your managers. And this is a uh, something we, uh, you know, uh, I think we do very well. Uh, I'm, you, you know, we, we, hiring is a is a tricky process, and you know we are of the opinion that. In the beginning, uh, when somebody comes in, skills are not that important. I mean, because I can teach a person. Human beings learn skills like that easily. Uh, but you can't teach somebody to be nice. You know, I, I don't believe you can. If, if somebody has a certain personality, it's very hard to, you know, change them just in the course of, uh, you know, training for a job. Uh, and, you know, they, they just need to come back with a different attitude. I agree with you. I oh. think, go ahead. Okay, yeah, so uh, it's a, it's so management is who you hire. You know, it's, it's what kind of people you have, how you run your. Uh, do they understand their goals? Um, how cohesive is the team? What is the vibe within that team? Uh, because one person can destroy that vibe. That's uh, uh, that, that's another thing that is important to remember. If you hire one wrong person, it destroys the entire you know, dynamic inside the restaurant. So you need to pay attention to the, to little things like that. Uh, and we have very genuine, you know, our employees are free no, without a limit. Uh, and this is not as conventional, you know, as you might think. Uh, most restaurants charge people, you know, their employees. They put limits on what they can eat. And they just get discounts. Most, you know, pizzerias, like, I would say pretty much everyone I know, they just give them like a 25, 30% discount. Um, 
And when we, when we talked with my partner, I was like, look, yeah, we have expensive ingredients. I understand that. But, you know, it's like I feel you know a little funny because we keep telling them they're family. But, you know, but I guess when you when they want to eat, we're not their family anymore, you know, because they're not need to pay you. Uh, and I just feel shitty about this. So why don't we just do this and, uh, uh, you know, and just have this kind of, uh, you know, environment where people feel like it's their, it is their home. You know, like it's, uh, it, 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 and my partner, because he spends a lot of time time with them, he's like their dad, because a lot, a lot of them are young kids. Uh, he just really gets into their, uh, you know, he they share his personal problems with them, uh, which can be very time consuming. He just like, the other day he spent eight hours to the dealership trying to get, uh, 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 you know, our, our one of our younger employees, who, by the way, a uh, very interesting story. This kid is a refugee from Afghanistan. His dad worked with the American military there, and he, and he, and he was murdered. Uh, so this kid got, um, you know, like a green card, whatever the visa that they give to, uh, you know, people who work with the U.S. government. And, you know, he came here with his mother and, you know, like an uh, uh, older brother. And this kid works like, uh, I've never seen anybody work like that. And, you know, within two years, he bought himself his first car, which is a Mercedes. And we're so happy, you know, for him. Uh, it's like, you know, it's an entry level, of course. But, uh, you know, the kid works at the pizzeria, buys a Mercedes. It's a great, great story, you know. And so, so Lee spent, my partner spent like several hours with him just and then ended up co-signing, uh, you know, the, uh, the loan for the kid. Um, so that's, you know, and when you have relationships like that, people do give, do their best. That's you know uh, they they tend to give they tend to really care they take ownership yeah i agree with you 100 percent um and i think that having that relationship with the employees and and just just for reference i've oh i've i believe the same thing i've always fed my employees as much food as they want to eat for every meal like it doesn't matter we're producing it anyway like, why wouldn't I share it with you so you guys can enjoy it? Also, tasting the quality of the product. Like, you're also reflecting, like, if it's not good uh, and everyone's looking around, we've got a problem. All of you now know we have a problem. There's something going wrong with the food. And so, like, it's that also. But mainly, and that's like the icing on the cake. That's just a benefit. That's not why I did it. What I did is because I believe everyone should have access to food. And if you're a food facility and producing it, you should figure out how to make sure that you're um, – the the team members, the employees that work with you, even when the vendors would come in or the drivers for the delivery trucks, we would feed them too. Because here's the other thing. Here's the other icing on the cake is your employees, the your vendors, your your whatever, your DoorDash drivers or whoever drivers you're, you have for your delivery service, they're your best word of mouth other than social media now. Okay? So well, it's not way, actually not the delivery. consumers – that talk about it. It's actually these vendors, these employees, these DoorDash drivers, that if they get a chance to try the product or you treat them well when they come into your store, they're the ones spreading the news word of mouth faster than the consumers are. And I'm not saying not to take care of your consumers. I'm just having everyone be aware that when you do the right thing, you feed people who are helping you and part of your business, and then they're getting ownership in it. They can give comments on the food or if they like it. I've even seen customers make specialty pizza is based on some of their favorite vendors or favorite products or and and collaborate over the long run with them which again it's sharing in that ownership and then they become the best word of mouth but i i think it's first like we talked about you gotta have your own identity and then obviously you want to treat your employees well because they'll spread the news but then as you start doing things like you talked about the pizza parties and stuff like that you're starting to build word of mouth with a lot of different people which i think is pretty awesome yeah thank you yeah, we actually started to stop doing deliveries uh, about a year ago. It was a scary decision, uh, but you know it was just creating unnecessary problems for us. You know because the to hire your own drivers, the market has dried up for this because you know everybody wants to work for Uber, you know, and DoorDash and things like that. Uh, and those guys were just, uh, you know, the way it works for the way it works uh, at least in our area is that first of all our wait times are a little bit long, uh, longer sometimes during peak hours and they weren't able to accommodate that so it was creating problems uh, and also people don't get the same product you know thin crust pizza gets cold very quickly and the boxes really kill it 
so we decided just to, it was a scary decision because obviously the pizza and delivery kind of go hand in hand. And we, uh, we just wrote like a nice letter to everybody and saying, look, you know, we'd rather keep the price slow and just stop doing deliveries, uh, period. And it almost didn't affect our business. You know, I mean, we make less uh, in terms of volume, but more in terms of profit. And, uh, you know, that's, and it just, again, you give people what they want. They don't need coupons. They don't need delivery. You know, if they love your product, they're going to come. And that's what happened. I, so, uh, yeah, so, so it is, yeah, it is kind of, you know, all important to yeah. have good product and to care for people. I mean, I know it's, it's, it's kind of a common sense and, you know, everybody knows it, but it is what it is and that's how it works. It's interesting that you say that because I agree with this a lot and we're actually, I'm working on another podcast. I have another one, the Centurion Leadership Battalion for anyone who's listening, but I also, we're about to launch, um, and by the time this episode comes out, it will have been launched, and we've already recorded a bunch of episodes. It's called The Night Dasher uh, with Justin Bizarro, and it's actually a full analysis of what's going on in this, like, um, we're subcontracting the delivery of our food. We're no longer owning it. Like delivery started with Chinese food companies. They've always been doing delivery since like the 1920s in New York City. I think that's where it originated, 1900, somewhere around there. And Chinese food has always done it. It's just been part of their thing. But then Domino's brought it into their business model as the main thing of their business model. Like no one eats Domino's pizza at Domino's. It's never been that way one, uh, and since the first location ever opened, I think in Kansas City or something. I can't remember exactly. But that's become like a staple of like that's their business model. So their pizza has Domino's. One of the things is their pizza has always been designed to be delivered. Okay. Just so everyone's aware, it's not what's typical of every other place. Little Caesars has gone to that model. But I will say this. The difference in what we're talking about here is you're controlling your product. You're controlling the customer experience all the way through. You're not subcontracting it out. And I think that that's an important thing. And I think what's happening is the delivery businesses blew up so fast. Um, you know, the Ubers, the Grubhubs, the Postmates, which I think is owned by Uber now. Uh, DoorDash, um, whatever other ones are out there. I think there's some others out there depending on where you live and maybe some other global ones. I don't know. I have the most experience yeah. with DoorDash. But the thing is, is we it, it grew so fast, we almost are still trying to catch up. Like I see businesses that that are still struggling that are bringing on these deliveries because on one hand, it opens up a funnel. Okay. On another hand, they're now become your gatekeeper. So if you start running behind schedule, they start limiting the orders. Okay. That's one. Number two is, or number three, I guess, technically is the packaging, the process, the food that you create, what works in the stores doesn't work in the delivery system always. And DoorDash drivers can get stacked up and they can stop at multiple restaurants, for example. And so the caring about your product as you do as the entrepreneur is going to be different. Like they care about the product, but DoorDash, Uber, we're not, they're not taking food safety classes or food handling classes like you would a delivery driver if they work for you personally. You'd want them to have a certain level of training and certain level of thing. It's more or less like, oh, you can drive a car, you have one, you have car insurance, you have a good driver's license and a decent car, boom, deliver food. And it's like, okay, how do you proper handle food? What is, how do you, how do you have customer service training? We sort of don't provide all of that. I'm going to talk about it in the, in the podcast or we already have, but I just want to anchor this because I wasn't expecting you to say that actually. Um, yeah. but I do want to anchor it because I have, I do see a lot of people pulling back on delivery and saying, no, this is what we do. I don't want to pay the extra money. I don't want to overcharge the customer for a worse product because whether or not it's the same product leaving as someone would pick it up eating the driving time, sometimes the way the drivers handle it and, and things like that can cause it to not be the same product, but they're paying more because of the fees, the service charges, the tips, and then the paying the drivers, which I believe a lot of businesses need delivery. It's your business model. And your business model should be that way, then you need to perfect your delivery. But if you if you have a genuinely premium product, it's very hard to deliver premium. Okay. It's just hard. I don't know why we don't have proper ways of doing it. You know, Domino's has heaters in their electric cars to keep the pizzas like 
optimum and they drive electric cars now and they only have they don't use outside services that i'm aware of uh, maybe they do but i have not seen them use a doordash or an uber yet but maybe i'm wrong but i do see their drivers running around with their electric cars and their heaters all the time so like I said, if you're going to do it, you've got to understand that you've got to create a product line that maybe is just delivery and it's and how are you going to deliver it and keep it warm. And a DoorDash driver, regardless if they have hot bags or pizza bags or catering bags um, or they turn on the heat seat, which I know Uber like prides themselves on because they tell their drivers to turn on their heated seats, it doesn't necessarily keep the quality of the product and it's not necessarily – the right way of doing it because there's also cold items in the bag there's also desserts there's also now beverages and you know it's a very hard thing and you know the only one that i would say is 100 percent knocking it out of the park in my opinion from what i've seen in the packaging is mcdonald's i don't know why but they've they've been doing this a long time food's been on the go for them a long time their food tends to hold up better I mean, fries still get soggy here and there, but they seem to have the delivery system down, the the cups go in the bag, so on and so forth. Again, I talk about it on the Night Dasher, but I just want to anchor this point on this podcast with the audience because you have a high-quality premium brand, and what we're hearing here in the audience is that brand should not be diminished, and its value and its perceived value should not diminish because you're turning it over to a third party. And I love that you talked about this, and I agree with it 100% in many ways. Um, so thank you, Emil. I love this topic. My last question, and then I'll and then we can get going. How do you? How are you? As you go about franchising, how are you filtering franchisees to make sure they they match the character, the core values, the business acclimate, and like the mindset that you're looking for in your franchises? Uh, well, I have. First of all, you need to make sure that they can do it because there's a lot of people who want to do it, but they don't have the means, you know, and, uh, you know, they're, they're dreaming about it. Uh, and you can, uh, uh, you know, but they, they just don't have enough money and you need to uh, have them understand that this, this is a, a business that requires, uh, you know, uh, certain funding. So that's number one. You know, uh, number two is, um, you know, you, you just uh, you need to choose a location. So not all locations uh, and not all geographical areas I want to expand in, into at this moment. So you need to choose uh, where you want to be and then, uh, you know, making sure that this is the right personality. Now, it's, it's not, this is where it gets a little tricky because some potential franchisees, they're not going to be running the restaurants by themselves. Uh, and uh, they, in fact, investors, they want to buy like, uh, you know, uh, uh, several franchises, for example, for for a state like, and open five, six restaurants and then have somebody run them. And so, so there you have, you know, have to uh, have rules in place and also believe that they will do what they promise they will do in terms of keeping the spirit. Uh, on the individual level, you just. Like I said, the same as, as with employees. You just uh, uh, talk to the person. And there were some people I spoke with that I felt were right. And there were some people that I spoke with that I felt weren't right for this. And, uh, you know, and you want to be polite and turn them down politely, you know, but um, you, you do need to turn them down uh, because it's, uh, uh, you know, expanding business in the wrong way is actually what may actually shrink it. You know, you, you just need to be careful and make sure that everybody who joins the business is going to join with the correct energy is going to multiply what you do and not sabotage it. Yeah, I agree with you. So, so the, yeah, it's, it's very important for us to, uh, to remain who we are extremely important because that's the whole business model. You know, this thing remaining an island of humanity with, uh, in a mechanized world, uh, it, it, it's something I live by, you know, and, uh, especially now with the, with the chat GPT and everything else, you know, with artificial intelligence, the world's going to change rapidly. And uh, this, and, and, and the human touch is disappearing rapidly from all aspects of life. You know, more and more you deal with machines only. Um, and with, including with food. I mean, I, I read all the time. I actually, uh, you know, the, the robot pizzas, I think Elon Musk tried to do that. 
uh, uh, or uh, as a joke, or I don't know. But I, I know there are lots of companies there. We've, we've been offered automation of uh, a lot of processes, and we just don't go for it because it's going to affect the quality, it's going to affect the spirit, of course. I actually got a proposal just recently to partner up with a company that builds, um, you know, and they have tremendous funding. Apparently, it's like some kind of startup, uh, you know, pizza vending machines that they want, is like Boratino pizzas. Uh, because it was, oh, you guys stand for quality. I was like, yeah, but once we put them into those machines, we're not going to be standing for quality anymore. You know, this is it. Uh, yep. And I understand it. Yeah, it's a good contract, and, uh, you know, I can sell you a lot of pizzas. I mean, a lot of pizza studios, but these are not going to be our pizzas, and this is going to ruin our brand. You know, it's going to take it in a completely different direction. So you have to just be mindful of things like that, and uh, that, you know, sometimes opportunities, uh, they're, they're a mirage. You know, they, they may sound good, but they, uh, they may lead your brand into a desert, you know. So uh, that's it. I mean, I, I don't have any, like, crazy wisdom, so I'm not a, you know, <laughs> yeah, like a ruler of the world. I mean, I, we just have a small, successful business, and those are little things that I would believe in, you know. And yeah, you're well on your way to learn. being a Jedi master, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but, you know, we'll see. Listen, uh Here's the thing. If people love what we do, they, they, we're going to grow. And if we do things the wrong way, we won't. You know, so it, 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 let's hope that um, we, I'm, I'm hoping that we won't make any huge mistakes going forward because I think what we got going is pretty good. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I love this, actually, and I appreciate your time so much and, and finally yeah, being sure. able to get on here. And, you know, I think what I'll do is I know you're a super busy guy, but I'm going to reach out again in a few months and see if we can do hear about the franchises, see how they're going, maybe even talk about the business and, and where you're hoping to grow from there. Because I think you are on a, quite a path of growth. You're on the end of the hockey stick. You know, it plateaus at first and you're learning. And we talked about that. What do I do? And we're not doing well. And then you sort of integrate the reels and the marketing and, and the new menu ideas and your business grows. So I love that. Where can they find you online? Where can they find you on social media? Uh, Boratino Pizza on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, same username. Uh, Boratino Pizza, B U R A T T I N L. Um, uh, you know, on our website, boratinopizza.com. And uh, is there anything you want to leave anyone with? Is there anything that I missed about your business that you want to share or anything that you'd want to share with, with anyone before we go? Ah, uh, enjoy life. <laughs> enjoy pizza. You know, that's all. I mean, uh, I think we've, we've covered pretty much everything. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. I appreciate you guys. I don't know if anyone could hear it, but even in the studio with the soundboard, there was a thunderstorm that went through here pretty nastily. And I know maybe there was some interference here and there on the phone. And we, um, but I think that it went through crate. If there's any noise in the background or thunder, I apologize to everyone. It usually doesn't happen, but it was pretty nasty storm that just came through new york city uh on a really rapid basis so that was kind of cool but also very loud so again everyone thank you for listening in i appreciate all of you guys i appreciate everyone who's listening in and gaining from this i appreciate the word of mouth i appreciate the sharing and all of what you guys are doing uh we don't push this podcast a lot we don't you know generally pay for marketing and advertising um because what we're trying to do is attract the right thing and attract people to the show and actually deliver a message. It's not so much about volume as it's about content for us and being a premium product, not in delivering it in the bells and whistles of like fancy things. It's about the content inside the shows when you listen and how they come out and what the entrepreneurs are sharing. And if you listen to this episode, I I guarantee anyone will gain lots of yummy nuggets of information that they can snack up because this is the way the world is going. And one of the things I will leave everyone with, I'm going to leave everyone with three points, okay? One is, as we talked about, is be true to yourself always and build the brand as if it were you, okay? At the very beginning, you have to do it because people are going to come in and see you and you're going to be a reflection of the brand. And if it doesn't match your brand or you are going to have an identity crisis, okay? Number two, hard work pays off every time, okay? The, the reels, the we talked about the kid from Afghanistan buying the Mercedes. We talked about 
both business partners, one from Korea, one from Georgia, the American Dream in mixed in here, which we didn't even really talk about, but there's a whole layering of American Dream, three people, one story, Afghanistan, Korea, Georgia, okay? Also, building businesses, being entrepreneurs, having dreams big enough that they're fitting everyone else's dream in it. So just so we're real, Emil's dream was so big that it fit this kid from Afghanistan and his mother who came over here as kind of refugees in a way, um, for lack of a better term, lost their father who was helping the Americans. And now they're come over here without anything and he's been able to build something, but it's he's been able to build something within Emil's dream. Okay, that's number two. Number three is no matter what we do or how we do it, at the end of the day, customers aren't dollars, they are relationships. And the better those relationships and the more we give them a premium product and tr- and not worry about the money like the delivery and having control of our product, okay, we have control of our product, we control the experience with our customers, then you will be beneficial, then your social media benefits and all that. You've got to back it up with reels and you've got to back it up with content and things people want to see. But you need to have substance or no matter how many reels you have or whatever as a food business, they don't always keep going that way. And your business, while it may have 3,000 reels or likes on a reel or 30,000 or 300,000, it doesn't always convert to dollars. And if you can't convert it to dollars, it's usually because something is not matching and there's not a flow between what's going on on social media and your actual business. And so I will leave everyone with that. If you control your brand, you control the premium, and it matches what you're doing online, that is a, a magic formula for everyone to start a profitable food business. And you got to have good food, okay? Like, I don't even want to go there. You got to love food. You got to love being in food, and you got to create good food. That's like, that's just the ticket to play the game at this point. To have good food, the hard stuff comes next. Like, all the hard shit comes after you've created good food, okay? And everyone's like, that's the hardest part. No, it's not the hardest part trying to figure out what you need to produce. The hardest part is then getting in in front of everyone and figuring out ways to do it. And there's a lot of tools that we talked about just on here. Word of mouth, you know, whether it's drivers, vendors, customers. There's there's one more thing. Actually, I'm going to give a fourth one. Normally, I don't do this. But the fourth one is don't give sales. Don't give discounts. Don't use coupons if you're trying to build a premium brand. If you want premium brand and you don't want to be chasing margins and competition and pricing and you want to be your own true brand, don't give discounts. You devalue yourself. Like, I'm worth this, but hey, I'm not worth this today. I'm worth it tomorrow, but not today. Huh? That's causing brand identity. That's why someone can have a Caesars pizza and a Pizza Hut pizza and a Papa John's pizza and a Domino's pizza and really not care the difference. Although I will say I see so much loyalty with Domino's based on their delivery system, but they are a delivered pizza. That's their specialty. They aren't going for premium in the store experience surround yourself with friends and family you know that experience is different than they're trying to get pizza to you in 15 minutes or less that's high quality delivered pizza but that's not what we're talking about here the variety the variation the customization the wild things that you talk about on your pizza the buffalo excuse me the bison the boar all those sort of awesome things that you guys are experiment the thanksgiving pizza I think all come because you're not delivering. All come because you get to interact with the customers and they get to see it and experience it as well. So, Emil, I appreciate you very much for coming on the show. Oh, thanks, Justin. Well, and, good luck with your podcast and uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. Yeah, absolutely. If you guys want to find us again, you can find us on Spotify or wherever else you grow yourself through podcasts. If you're hungry and you don't want to leave your couch or your office, open up the DoorDash app. You might find one of the food entrepreneurs that are on this show in your local area. And if you want to find me, you can find me on Instagram at Justin the Food Entrepreneurs or at Justin Bizarro. Again, B I W Z A W R O. And I love you guys, and we're out. Okay. Take care. Bye, Justin.